So now let's apply the central limit theorem to a problem. In the United States, the year each coin was minted is printed on the coin. So to find the age of the coin, you simply subtract the current year from the year that's printed on the coin. So the age of circulating pennies are right skewed. Assume the ages of circulating pennies have a mean of 12.2 years and a standard deviation of 9.9. .9. Okay, so let's just think about this for a second, right? So we have pennies, right? So you can figure out how old a penny is by looking at it and looking at the year it was minted. So I'm filming this in 2023. So if a penny was minted in 2000, that's a 23 year old penny, right? So this is the age of the pennies. So if you think about this, these are the new pennies over here. And these are the old pennies. Now, keep in mind, these are in circulation. We're not talking about, you know, a 150-year-old penny that's, that's sitting in somebody's collection. These are circulating pennies, as in they're in the economy, they're out and doing things in the world, right? Not just hiding away in, in a, um, a display. All right, so what is the population here? Well, the population would be all circulating pennies. in the world, right? And the sample, well, let's see. We have, oh, it says right here, a random sample of size n equals 40 is drawn from the population. So we have a random group of pennies. And the sample size is 40. All right, now, is the variable age of penny quantitative or qualitative? Explain. Oh, well, it's definitely quantitative, right? The age of a penny, just like the age of anything, quantitative. There's always one more T in there than I think there should be. All right, so it's quantitative because age is a number that we can do meaningful calculations from. Just a little review of quantitative versus qualitative. So the age of anything um, generally would be quantitative, right? Because we can do calculations from age. Oh, here's another review, right? So, th so this, by the way, is review of section one one. This the A, B, and C. Those are that's that's uh, old school. I'm just gonna put that in there. Just so you guys know where to go look that stuff up if you want it. That's section 1-1, one, one, way back. This particular bit is a review of section 1-2, when we talked about um, cross-sectional observational study versus case control versus cohort. Of course, pennies are not capable, at least in this particular iteration, of having an experiment. I mean, you can experiment with the metal that makes up pennies, but that's different. So this is section 1.2. Well, we're not going to cohort the pennies. We're not tracking the pennies over time. So um, let me just remind everybody the difference. So this is when we track a group of pennies um, over time, which you could do for, say, like an economic study. I mean, I don't know how you would manage it, but um, oops, over time. So you'd want to, you know, get this particular group of, you know, a thousand pennies or 40 pennies and somehow watch them as they flow through the economy or something like that. Sorry. Right. This is looking at the records of pennies. Right. So if you somehow had a record of where each particular penny went, right. Which of course is kind of ridiculous. Like they don't do that for pennies, but they do do it for other things. Right. There are things that get tracked like that. Right, animals. Um, there are monetary things that get tracked over time. So you'd look at the records, right? You'd look at the records of where these pennies have been and what they've done for the last, you know, 10 years, that kind of thing. All right, well, I think you can see these are kind of ridiculous. There's no way it's that. And that's because of this. And when we look at the pennies and we consider them their age right now, where they are at, at this moment, which is what it is. 
Well, that was a nice little review. All right, now we want to verify the conditions of the central limit theorem are met. All right, so the conditions, sometimes I'll write requirements, same thing, right? So there are three conditions, random, independent, and I'm writing this just how I would like you to write it when you do this for problems. It'll be the same thing. Now, the easiest of the three is random. Random is almost always given to you in the problem. It'll be said somewhere. So I, when I say given, I mean literally given, <laughs> as in I wrote it. So I wrote it right here. It's given. So random is yes, because it's given in the problem. You can just write given. Um, for your, your assignments, but that's what that means. It means literally it was written. Somewhere in the problem it was written that it was random. And honestly, if it's not given, it's almost always safe to assume. We don't have the tools in this course of dealing with um, non-random items. All right, independent is the trickiest to get your mind around, <laughs> right? So let's talk about it. So we need little n, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give myself some space here, to be less than 0.05 capital N. Now, little n was given. Little n is 40. Here, I should, I should write that right here. This is little n right there. So I know that that number is 40. And I want that to be less than or equal to 0 0.05. Now, here's where I'm in trouble. Sometimes I'm going to give you the number for capital N, and sometimes I won't. And when I don't give it to you, you can look it up on Google if you want, or you can write out what the population would be. So for example, I went to Google and I looked it up <laughs> and I get um, information somehow from some problem that there's 150 billion pennies in circulation, right? So I could do it that way. Or I can just write out the words. I can say, look, capital N must be all circulating pennies, what we wrote basically up above for the population. And then this is, of course, it's true. I mean, we just saw when we Googled this, this was 150 billion, right? So you could, you could also write 150 billion from Google if you want and go search it out. Either way is fine, right? A lot of times Google won't have the answer though. That's the thing. So we need to make a note to ourselves. This is an important note, right? So if n is not given, and I will not give it some of the time, right? If n is not given, you can go, um, you, you have two outcomes, right? Two ways to tackle that, right? So you can go research it, or you can just write, I'll just write this. So if n is not given, you can write it out in context. Just write out the population for the context. Or Google it. It's my face. Right? You don't have to Google it. It's just a, you know, if you want to, right, you can get it. Okay? So and and will not be given sometimes. And other times it will be given. And if it's given, you could just put it in there. Right? So if it was given, if you knew it was 150 billion, or if it's not given and you write all circulating pennies, either way, you don't actually have to do this calculation. Like, this is a huge number. And whatever 5% of it is, you know 40 is less than 5%. So you just kind of say, yes, of course, right? Um, here, yes, of course, right? Because of this. Right? So this is proving that argument. And again, uh, sometimes I won't give it to you, just write it out in words, or go search it for it, and then sometimes I will give it to you, in which case put the number in that I give you. You only have to do this calculation 0.05 times this number if the number is small, just to, just to make sure 40 is less than that. And that only happens a couple times. Honestly, most of the time this is going to be, you know, 100 million, 200 million, something like that. And so you won't need to bother finding 0.05 times it.
All right, now normal's easy as well. So yeah, random is the easiest one because random is given. <laughs> normal is also pretty easy because if we look back at the central limit theorem, if a population was normal, we could stop right there and be like, it's normal. But we don't have that. We actually know it's skewed. It's skewed right, so it's not normal. But then if it's not normal, we just need the sample size to be large which it is. Our sample size is bigger than 30. So that would be this piece down here. Yes, because n, which is 40, is greater than 30. And we're done. So that's what you show. So random, given, independent is kind of the hardest one. It has this little formula, and then you plug in the pieces that you know and don't know for the formula, and then make a little argument, of course. And then normal can be sure, right, if, you, if the population was normal, then you'd be like, yep, it's normal. But if it's not given that it's normal, then you have to have n be bigger than 30. And I will tell you in the next section, in 8.2, these first two parts stay the same. This part changes a little bit, right? It's not bigger than 30. It's something else. But that's the one part that changes. All right. So that's how you answer those questions. You will be asked them regularly from here on out. So that's how you do them. To verify conditions, it's random, independent, normal. You say given up here, or you make an argument if it's not given. right? You make some argument for why it's a random sample. Then why is this independent? You write the formula. You plug in the pieces you know. And then normal. All right, now, if, since those pieces are met, that means we're ready to describe the sampling distribution. So describing the sampling distribution also has three steps. It has shape, it has center, and it has spread, all of which are worth points. And I'm, I'm writing these both of these, E and F, exactly as I want you to write them when you do them for assignments. All right, now the shape, we just said, we just proved above, it's normal. So we're done. We're done with that conversation. It's normal. The center. The center is the mean of the x bars, right? That's what it said right here. The mean of the x bars, there's my symbol, is my mean. And my mean was, uh oh, I got to go back up to the top. Ah, it says it right here. It says the mean is 12.2 years. Right? And the standard deviation, while I'm sitting here, is 9.9 .9 .9 years, years. All right, so this will be 12.2 years. Then the spread. The spread, well, we just saw there's a formula for it. It's the standard error of the x-bar, which is the sigma x-bar. These are different symbols. So this is kind of more old-fashioned symbol with a subscript. This is kind of the way computers write it. So StatCrunch, for example, writes SE, right? SE means standard error, right? Okay, so the standard error of the x-bar, which is sigma of the x-bar, is sigma divided by the square root of n. Sigma up above was 9.9 .9 over the square root of n, n was 40. And we would find that with Desmos. Right, we're not going to be magically finding that by hand. <laughs> right, so I take 9.9 .9, divided by the square root of 40. And we get 1.565. And it would have the same unit, actually. It would be years, just like standard deviation does, right? Because standard error is a standard deviation. It's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means. So it's, this, it's, it's complicated, <laughs> right? That's the standard deviation, 9.9. .9. This is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, right? Standard deviation of the population is 9.9. .9. Standard deviation of the sampling distribution with the x bars is 1.565. And one more note of caution. I will tell you that your science teachers expect you to know what standard error is. Standard error is a common term used in science because, of course, in science you're taking a lot of samples, say for like labs or things like that. And so how the samples vary is the standard error, right? So this is standard error. 
right? That's what SE stands for. Standard error is the standard deviation of the samples. It's how samples change.